so CC, uh, good to see you guys this morning. I'm coming in with a lot of energy. I had a cup of coffee, so feeling good. So, um, But today is July 2nd, so in two days it will be Independence Day, and so I wanted to take some time to honor those um, who have fought for our freedoms. Um, Jesus saved us. Um, he gave his life. Um, our freedom from sin came at a price, um, and I think our freedoms here in the United States came at a price as well. And so I just want to take a moment of silence and honor those who have fought for those freedoms um, or are still fighting today. So if you'll take a moment of silence with me. All right. Uh, so as Scott said, I am the middle school minister here at Sherwood Oaks, and I've been on staff teaching middle schoolers for the last three years. This is my fourth year now, um, and it has been amazing. I truly love the experience of getting to work with this next generation, but uh, like Scott also said, this is my first sermon here in main service. So as Sean um, was meeting with me and we were preparing this together, um, I was reminded of the story of Jonah. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Maybe you've heard it before as the Bible story of Jonah and the big fish. Uh, I encourage you guys to read it for yourselves if you haven't. It's not a very long book. It's really easy to read. But towards the end, Jonah gave this sermon to the people of Nineveh, which I believe to be one of the worst sermons of all time. In Jonah 3, 4, it says, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's it. That's the sermon. Just that. And after, it sa after he says this, it says that the Ninevites believed God and everyone from the greatest to the least, including the king, began to repent and turn from their sin. As a minister, this is one of the most encouraging passages to me. Because if that sermon can turn the hearts of an entire city, well, then maybe there's hope for a guy like me. Um, but that's kind of what we've been talking about here through this series of Hebrews 11. If you aren't familiar with the passage, the writers of Hebrews are describing this idea of faith lived out through actions of all of these amazing people that we read about in the Old Testament. Some people refer to this section as the Bible's hall of fame or heroes of faith, men and women who lived out what it means to trust and follow God. If you were with us at the start of this series, Beth Long and David Shunk gave this great sermon setting up what we would be going through through the series. They chose to focus on the first two verses of this passage and what I believe to be the thesis statement of this chapter. Hebrews 11, one through two says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for, assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. The next part of this passage will go on to talk about these heroes of faith who even when they couldn't see what was next, even when they had their doubts or questions, they chose to take a step of faith and trust in God. People like Abraham, Joseph, Jacob, amazing people, no doubt. But I want us to take a moment and pause and remember just how human these heroes of faith truly were. Abraham and Sarah were old, way past the age of having kids, who went on to foster a generous, or generation of people as numerous as the sands of the seashore. Jacob was a liar and a thief that became a father to a nation of people meant to be a trustworthy priesthood to all nations, pointing them to God. Joseph was a tattletale, overprivileged kid who would go on to save both Israel and Egypt from a famine. David was a shepherd boy who wrote poems in his free time that became one of the greatest warriors and kings of Israel. I don't want us to admire these heroes so much that we forget just how human and how unlikely they were to accomplish these great feats. As I read through the story of the Bible, I am constantly reminded that God often chooses to use the most unworthy and unlikely of people to carry out his mission. I'm gonna say that again. As, we re as I read through the story of the Bible, I am constantly reminded that God often chooses to use the most unworthy and unlikely of people to carry out his mission. Which brings us today to the story of Moses. Moses is a huge part of God's story 
and he was the writer of the first five books that we have in our Bible. You might know them as the Torah, which is just a fancy word um, for the books that we know of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. His story is so big and it spans multiple books that there's no way that we're going to be able to cover it all today. But in Deuteronomy 34, 10 through 12, it says this, Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, face to face, who did all those signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his officials and to this whole land. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in all the sight of Israel. So Moses is kind of a big deal. We're going to be focusing on some of the key parts of his story today. But I encourage you guys, once again, read it for yourselves because he is an incredible person. So here's a brief summary for some background context to Moses' story. Um, And if you know any minister, um, when I say brief, um, I don't have any concept of what that word means. So there is a great famine in the land of Egypt and the surrounding settlements. But God had raised up Joseph an Israelite to save the people. Joseph was made aware of this famine by God before it happens, and he's appointed ruler of Egypt to start saving extra food. Joseph does a great job at this, and the famine happens, and the people are saved. And it all sounds great, right? Well, it turns out when the Israelites were saved by this famine, they also had to sell almost everything they owned to buy extra food from Egypt which included themselves. Many Israelites sold themselves into slavery to buy food for their families, which wasn't that bad at the time. Pharaoh was actually a big fan of Israelites. I mean, Joseph was the one who saved them from the famine. But things take a change for the worse when a couple generations pass and there's a new sheriff in town. Wasn't actually a sheriff, those weren't a thing yet. Just a new Pharaoh. But you get the idea. This new Pharaoh did not care about Joseph. All he knew was that there were a ton of Israelites around, and he wasn't sure that they would be loyal to Egypt if an opposing army attacked them. So, like any great leader, he decides to win their favor. Just kidding. He appoints slave masters over them and decides to oppress them with forced labor. But this doesn't work. The Israelites grow even more numerous, so he decides to take it up a notch. And he issues this horrible order that all male babies are to be thrown in the Nile River. And this is where the story of Moses starts. Moses, a Hebrew boy, is born, and he is supposed to be thrown in the Nile River. But his mother hides him for three months, but when she can no longer keep him hidden, she puts him in a basket and floats him down a river. Now, it just so happens that the daughter of Pharaoh is bathing in the river during this time when she discovers the basket. I don't think this was any accident by Moses' parents. It most likely would have been known where and when the daughter of Pharaoh chose to bathe. In Hebrews 11.23, it says this, By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Now, Moses had to have something special about him as a baby. I mean, this part of him being no ordinary child is mentioned several times. I mean, this had to be one cute baby because the daughter of Pharaoh chose to pick him up and raise him as one of her own, like her own son. Now, as Moses grew up because of this, he was an Egyptian noble. He would have had the best education and training afforded to him as he was the son of Pharaoh's daughter. All things considered with the situation, he ended up with a pretty good deal. But despite all of this, Moses still chose to see himself as more of an Israelite than an Egyptian. In Exodus chapter two, it says this, one day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting, and he asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? 
Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have became known. Uh, and buddy, it did become known because after this, Pharaoh did find out and he wasn't too happy. He tried to kill Moses, but Moses was able to flee in time. Moses then settles down in a place called Midian and he finds himself a wife. And when I say he found a wife, I mean he rested at a well when seven women came to get water and multiple shepherds came to chase the woman off for some reason, as shepherds do. Um, but Moses stepped in and single-handedly came to their rescue. Now that is what I call a first date. Teach me your ways, Moses. Later on, the Lord would appear to Moses in the famous story of the burning bush. and He would tell him to go back to Egypt and rescue the people of Israel. He gives Moses all these great signs and wonders to perform so that the people know he's being sent by God. And Moses is like, that's great, God, but here's the thing. I'm not a great speaker, and I don't do well with speeches. That's the GIV, Grant Interpretive Version, um, but you guys get the idea. Moses has literally killed a man at this point. He's defended a group of girls from shepherds single-handedly, but he is too afraid to look foolish speaking in front of people. Some of you in the room are probably like, yeah, I could relate. But from here, we're gonna fast forward the story quite a bit. The next part of the story happens after the Israelites are freed from Egypt. Moses has seen the power of God part the Red Sea. He's seen God bring down the 10 plagues on Egypt. He's seen God provide food for them out of the sky. Moses has been a first-hand witness to the power of God. Now at this point, Moses and the people of Israel are wandering through the wilderness on their way to the promised land, and they run out of water. The people began to groan and complain to Moses, as they often have throughout the story. So Moses and his brother Aaron go to pray to God, and God tells Moses to gather all the people together and speak to this rock. And he tells him if he speaks to the rock, water will come flowing out. It's almost like God is telling him, after Moses, after all of this time, after all you've seen, will you finally trust me to speak in front of the people? And for whatever reason, Moses, possibly in his anger towards the people complaining or his continued fear of speaking, chooses to disobey God and strike the rock instead. He strikes the rock twice and God allows water to still flow out, but this does not come without consequences. In Numbers 20, 12, it says, But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. It's at this point that I begin to wonder just what God saw in Moses. Sure, he was great in a lot of ways, but Moses was a murderer. He doubted the power of God, and even though God was giving him the power to save the Israelites out of slavery, he was reluctant because he was afraid of speaking. And finally, after all of the signs and miracles and wonders that Moses had seen, he still chose to disobey and not trust in God. Why did God choose Moses? Surely he was unworthy of the task. As I read through the story of the Bible, I am constantly reminded that God often chooses to use the most unworthy and unlikely of people to carry out his mission. This statement rings so true for the story of Moses. Moses, like us, myself included, was unworthy for the mission. But God still chose to see the redeemable parts of Moses rather than his brokenness. So what were those qualities that God saw in him that made him see, I see your brokenness, but I can work with this. Three qualities stick out to me. Number one, Moses defended the helpless. Moses didn't grow too comfortable in his luxury of being the son of Pharaoh's daughter that he didn't see the injustice going on around him. Now, I've been up here for a while talking. I feel like we're family. I tell some jokes. You guys give me some pity laughs. I keep going on and on. It's a great relationship. Well, I'm going to be vulnerable for a moment. The next story is from my own life. 
Um, and it is truly a Gen Z type of story. A couple years ago, I went to visit a friend who lives in Chicago. So she sends me her address, pretty standard stuff, and all except the address that she sends me um, is an address that is also in Cincinnati. So when I type in the address to my GPS, it automatically assumes I'm going to the one in Cincinnati since it's closer. Now, a normal person probably would have caught the problem right there, but I am no mere normal person. So I plugged that away, I put on a podcast, and began to follow that blue line to the promised land. Now, again, most people, when they drive in the opposite direction, would have noticed and thought, something isn't right. But like I said earlier, not me. So I just keep on going, keep on going, following that blue line, and I get to the destination, and I call her, and I say, I'm here. And she says, what? You're like two hours early. So she goes outside and says, I don't see you. Send me your location. So I send it to her, and she says, okay, this can't be right. It says you're in Cincinnati. Um, and this was followed by a few very painful moments of silence as I worked up the courage to tell her that it was indeed right. I knew at this moment that this was going to be something I will never live down among the friend group. Whenever someone asks me for directions now, it's like my friends bust down the door and say, hey, hey, don't listen to this guy. Don't worsen the word he says. He drove to Cincinnati thinking it was Chicago. <laughs> I think about that story a lot. Not usually because I want to. Often people remind me of it. Um, and I think about how I was so focused on following that blue line. Comfortable in my car listening to that podcast that I just turned on autopilot mode and didn't notice the scenery around me. That would have indicated that I'm going in the wrong direction. I didn't care to look at the many street signs that would have told me I'm on my way to Cincinnati and not Chicago. Now I know this is a ridiculous story, believe me, but I think oftentimes in our own lives we can do this within life. We can get so focused on our problems, our jobs, our responsibilities that we don't take time to look around at what's going on around us. In Hebrews 11, 24 through 26, it says, By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was a looking ahead to his reward. It didn't matter if it was an Israelite slave or women from another land that he didn't even know. Moses chose to defend those who couldn't defend themselves. It reminds me of two of our mission partners, Deepak and Simi Dingra. They are mission partners we have here at Sherwood Oaks. They were from high caste Hindu Sikh families in North India. Deepak's dad was a diplomat with the government and they had a very high status and wealth in North India, but when they converted to Christianity, they were rejected by their families, business partners, and neighbors. The persecution forced them to leave their home and move to Australia seeking support from Christians there. Eventually, God called them back to their home to face the persecution and begin working to evangelize people in the lower caste systems. Their obedience cost them social status, family wealth and resources, and most of all, respect from their peers. However, because of their faithfulness, a movement began that to date has seen more than 21,000 first-generation believers come to Christ. Many of these members of these new churches have been persecuted, disgraced, beaten, and even some have lost their lives. But the church continues to grow there because the strong witness of faithfulness of Dingras and the many others willing to sacrifice status and cultural influence for the gospel. The second thing that sticks out to me about Moses is that he chose hope. Despite all the doubts that Moses had about his shortcomings and his speaking ability, he eventually chose hope. Moses wasn't sure that God was going to be able to save the Israelite people from the most powerful nation at that time. Moses grew up in Egypt. He would have known just how powerful 
they were firsthand. And Moses was supposed to lead the Israelites. Last time he tried to intervene in a fight between Israelites and tell them what to do, they went and told Pharaoh that he murdered someone. Snitches get stitches, come on. Moses had plenty of reason to doubt this rescue mission. But despite these doubts, Moses eventually chose to choose hope. If there was even a possibility that this God could save my people, then I have to take the chance. So he puts his own life in danger. He gives everything up that he's built in this new land on this hope that maybe, just maybe, this God can actually save his people. I would say one common thing among all the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11 is not what they have in gifts and talents, but it's what they choose to hope for. Hope for a better world. Hope that restoration can come despite all of the brokenness that they experience in their life. And it is a belief in this hope that I think God chooses to use in them more than any gift or talent that they may have. The third thing that I see in Moses was his willingness to sacrifice. Yes, Moses was able to save Israelites out of slavery from Egypt, but it did not come without a price. Moses traded that Egyptian Tempur-Pedic for a bed in the dirt. In his position as an Egyptian noble, he would have been well-fed, and he would have traded that to often go hungry in the wilderness. Moses would go on to build two lives, one in Egypt and one in Midian, where he was comfortable and content. Moses had a simple life in Midian. He had a wife and a family. He built something for himself. And he gave all of that up so that he could save others. These redeemable qualities that God chose to see in Moses are some of the very same qualities that we see in the character of Jesus. Paul tells us this in Philippians chapter 2 when he was talking about Jesus. Who, meaning Jesus, being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus chose to give up this great position with God, to become a mere man. Jesus would grow up in a family that wasn't wealthy. He would be beaten, he would be tortured, he would be mocked. And yet, through all of that, he would remain innocent. Enduring all of this so that he might save us, Jesus had hope that he could bring restoration to this broken world. And he laid down the ultimate sacrifice so that we may have life. Some of you here in the room right now might feel unworthy. You might feel as though you are the most unlikely person in the world to point other people to Jesus. You've messed up time and time again in your life and you find yourself in a pit that you feel you deserve. One of my best friends, John McArdle, once told me, I think all people fight the struggle of feeling like we aren't worthy of anything while simultaneously believing we're better than everyone else. That statement hit me hard and because I just see it so much in myself. I can look around and see the faults in other people and I can think if people would just be more like me. But then I'm also aware that deep down, I'm not worthy of anything. I've messed up so many times. I've hurt so many people. I'm not worthy of grace. And the truth is, I'm right. I'm not worthy of forgiveness. I am nothing but a sinner. But for whatever reason, God chooses to love me and give me grace regardless. Grace is just that. It is a gift undeserved. If you are unworthy, if you are underprepared, if you are unlikely, good. God often chooses to use the most unworthy and unlikely people to carry out his mission. The best part of all of this is we don't have to be. No matter what you've done, no matter what pit you've dug yourself into, God can still pull you up out of there and he can use you. I'll end here today 
with one final story. In the middle school ministry here at Sherwood Oaks, we've always tried to emphasize the importance of small groups. I had a small group throughout high school um, that has led me to have lifelong friends that I still have today. They are some of my lifelong friends. So in 2022, I started a seventh grade boys small group that met together every Tuesday. Many of the guys in this group had grown up together, but one of the seventh graders named Adam was new to the group that year, which I'm sure you guys know can always be a hard place to be. Well, in November of that year, Adam's dad passed away suddenly with a stroke. And suddenly he was faced with the reality of this broken world way too soon. Now, I don't know if you guys can remember too much about middle school boys, but empathy and vulnerability are not two of their strong suits. To be honest, I don't really know any other people group that would be more unworthy and unlikely to deal with this situation than middle school boys. But the way each of those boys stepped up and loved on Adam was nothing short of a miracle. The way they invited him into their group when they easily could have been worried about their own lives as kids. The way Adam courageously stepped up and shared among his peers that he was not okay and that he needed help. The level and courage and vulnerability from Adam was once again nothing short of a miracle. Now I'm not here to say everything is perfect now and it's all sunshine and rainbows. I don't think Adam would be afraid to tell you that that's not the case. But those guys continue to follow the Lord faithfully every day. They continue to support one another and just be brothers in Christ. And I don't know many other examples that demonstrate what the church should be more than that. Middle school boys living out their faith in a way that reflects the character of Jesus. So what will you choose to do this week? If you look down the list found in Hebrews 11, you will see that all of what is lifted, listed there is faith put into action. It isn't just believing, it is choosing to act. Will you defend the helpless this week? Will you choose to hope in the midst of brokenness? Will you choose to sacrifice for the sake of others? If so, it doesn't matter how unworthy or how unlikely you are. God can use you. Let the Holy Spirit fill you with his presence and go on a mission to point people to the only real source of hope there is, Jesus. If you're wondering about who this Jesus character is, then I encourage you, take a step of faith today. This whole series is faith in action a faith that is lived out. And sometimes that first step is the hardest to make. But I encourage you, be courageous, just like those middle school boys who stepped out in faith and chose to follow the Lord. If you'll pray with me. Jesus, I thank you for this day and I thank you for everyone in this room. I pray that you would be with us all as we deal with our sin, that we deal with our brokenness, Help us have hope for this world and the restoration that you bring. Help us go out and defend those who can't defend themselves. And Lord, help us sacrifice for the sake of others. Amen. Well, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, here's a playlist with more like it. Plus, be sure to give it a thumbs up and click subscribe to see more videos from Sherwood Oaks Christian Church. Also, if you have a friend or family member who may find this video useful, please click the share button below. Thanks again and have a great day.